the Ranger bullpen blows another one. Josh Young's stock, keep, stock keeps rising. And is it time for the Rangers to go with the six-man rotation when Jacob deGrom gets back? We're talking about all that and more on this episode of Locked on Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked on Rangers. Your daily Texas Rangers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. You are locked on to the Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Paddock, a criminally addicted Texas Rangers fan since 2010, the founder and host for all five seasons of this Locked On Rangers podcast. Thank y'all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Paddock. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Subscribe on YouTube, where if you're watching, you can see all these fancy new graphics we have. And the best way you can help grow the show is to comment nearly any single thing below. Today is Tuesday, May 23rd. Your Rangers are 29 and 18. Still alone atop the AL West with a very precarious one game lead over the uh, unfortunately surging Houston Astros. This was this was a a rough one. We're going to get into Dane Dunning's good start, Josh Young putting up some some massive numbers as of late. But first, this episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account and use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Now, Dane Dunning was solid again in this one, but it didn't matter because the bullpen yet again blew another late lead. A very, 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 very frustrating pattern that uh, just does not seem to have much of a a hint of stopping, which is deeply, deeply unfortunate. But a, a fine start from Dane Dunning, nonetheless, lowers his season ERA down to 167. Went five and two thirds innings, did allow six hits, three walks, which is a little concerning, which is one of the things that Dane Dunning has done so well, is is limit those walks, only three strikeouts, but just the one earned run mercifully. The bullpen did not allow his inherited runners to score. They they did allow five runners to score in the bottom of the seventh inning. We're going to get into what happened with all that in, in the third segment. I, I can't talk about it in the first segment. We're trying to, trying to stay positive. I'm trying to stay positive, which is very difficult with this bullpen the only thing positive is the amount of runs they are allowing it is is a big number a big old plus um which is a net negative for the rangers but dane dunning just continues to hold up and dominate in these in these starts this one he wasn't even that dominant this was not a great pirates team coming in they were three and seven in their last 10 before this win they've been really scuffling in the month of may a fantastic start to april i thought this was going to be a much more difficult series than it looked like coming in because they were in such a rough way but it didn't matter the rangers bullpen found a way to blow it late and and man the the opposing starter luis ortiz a luis l ortiz not the same luis ortiz that i believe there, there might be three Luis Ortiz's in baseball, and I believe all of them are pitchers, but but this Luis Ortiz was was honestly fantastic in this one. Seven two-thirds innings for the Rangers' opposition. Two earned runs, four strikeouts, two walks. I, I don't know how he had such a high ERA. His ERA is still over four on the season, but the stuff was nasty. It was well-located. It was moving well, and I don't blame the offense for not scratching a bunch of runs across. I mean, they only got two runs, and and the two run shot from Josh Young in the ninth inning, um, but only two runs against Luis Ortiz. Holderman uh, was not able to, was the only one who didn't give up a run in this one for the Pirates. The Pirates only had to use two relievers for an inning and a third. The Rangers had to use their bullpen for more than that, but Dane Dunning threw his most pitches in a start. 96 pitches was not quite able to close out the sixth inning. I don't know how much that would help because the seventh inning was a complete disaster. And the same guys who would have been pitching there uh, were still ended up pitching. Josh Spores gave up three runs. Only two of those, actually, I believe only one of those was his actual run because Joe Barlow came in and allowed the grand slam. Again, we're not talking about that. We do have an upgrade up, update on Jacob DeGrom. No upgrade update on the uh, Def Grom ranking, but DeGrom threw a bullpen on Monday, 32 pitches in his bullpen, 18, I believe, in the first simulated inning, and then, uh, whatever, 14 in the second, only threw fastballs. Um, it's his third bullpen in six days. He's feeling healthy. He's feeling like he turned a corner. He will throw another bullpen in Baltimore. That will be hopefully, hopefully the last one before we start to figure out if he is going to go on a rehab assignment or if the Rangers are just going to throw him straight into a game. He'll have to face 
five hitters at some capacity. Um, he'll throw breaking balls on that Friday bullpen in Baltimore. So we'll kind of have more of an update of when he is expected to be back. And one of the things that was debated, Evan Grant talked about this, of whether they should just use the <laughs> Dane Dunning as an opener versus for DeGrom whenever he comes back or kind of the the second guy, which is what it, it seemed like every time that Jacob DeGrom got hurt, Dane Dunning was thrown in there in a hurry and did very, very well in those outings and uh, bumped up his war total quite a bit because the Rangers were usually in a pretty good spot when Dane Dunning was coming in in relief of Jacob DeGrom. But I think that maybe for the first couple outings, that'll make sense depending on how often or how many rehab outings Jacob deGrom is going to throw I I say send him to rehab I think that's probably the best the best thing for him I know the Rangers want to get the most out of him and they're coming up on a stretch of some very difficult games including this weekend in Baltimore and it seems like these games against the Pirates are going to be no joke at all but um, I, I think that when he's healthy, the Rangers should go with a six-man rotation, or at least stop pitching Jacob Grom on four days rest. The only time that he did pitch on four days rest was when he got hurt and had to be placed on the IL. I don't think that's necessarily a coincidence. I don't think that Jacob Grom should be pitching on four days rest. I think that having having Dane Dunning in there is is definitely something that the rest of these starters need. We talked about it when Cody Bradford came up as basically a sacrificial lamb to push all these guys back a couple of days when the Rangers hadn't had a whole lot of off days. They don't, they have a, a stretch where they're not going to have a whole lot of off days at the end of June, which is going to be a really, really rough stretch. I think it's um, basically two weeks. It's from the uh, 23rd until the all-star break, June 23rd until the all-star break, the, which is uh, July 10th. So that's like, I think, three and a half weeks nearly four weeks without without a break and I think they're definitely going to have to use Dane Dunning as a as an extra starter there if if someone else gets hurt then they're gonna have to throw Cody Bradford there because you cannot ask this rotation full of these guys to go every fifth day for a three month or a like full four week stretch I think I I, I just that's just what I feel comfortable with with these guys you got to keep them healthy you got to keep them pitching well they are pitching well and they are in a good rhythm and I think that the health, whether you're sacrificing that game with it when you throw up a Cody Bradford out there against the Braves in a game where you're like, yeah, he's probably going to get thrown to the Wolves. He's probably going to get eaten alive and the Rangers are probably going to lose this. But the long-term health of these starting pitchers throughout the course of the season and throughout the course of just those next starts after that, I mean, if you sacrifice one game and the next five are, are brilliant from your starting pitchers, I, I think that's a sacrifice that you are willing to make for the the short term the Rangers do have a pair of off days in June one on the 8th actually three one on the first one on the 8th and one on the 22nd so not a whole lot of long stretches there without off days I mean the 9th through the 21st is their one long stretch there they have a road trip to Tampa then a homestand for a week and then a road trip a short road trip to um, the White Sox and then uh, extend that with a day off and then go to New York to face off against the Yankees but Basically, I think when this team has those stretches, they need to go with a six-man rotation. If you have a day off, then you can you know, skip Dane Dunning's start if the full rotation is healthy. But Dane Dunning has performed well. I mean, some, if you look at his, some of his expected numbers, and none of them are that great. It's It kind of seems like his ERA is going to fall back down to earth at one point. But for now, it, it's not. His expected ERA is 4.01. His actual ERA is 1.67. Um, his hard hit rate is around the middle of the pack. Same with average exit velocity um, and WOBA, expected WOBA, um, or expected WOBA, not regular WOBA. And the expected slugging percentage against him is, you know, right there in the middle of the pack. But he is not getting guys to barrel balls. He is not walking guys. He's not giving up extra base runners. And when you don't have the most overpowering stuff like Dane, like Dane Dunning does not, then you cannot allow the walks and you just got to get those ground balls as, as often as you can. And the Rangers defense has done a pretty good job of converting those into outs, especially Marcus Simeon, who has been on a terrific pace and has one of the other infielders, Josh Young, who continues to rise in his rookie of the year stock. We're going to talk about Josh Young and a little concern about Jonah Heim in just a second. But first, this episode is brought to you by SoRare. 
Our new sponsor, So Rare, is a revolutionary fantasy baseball game and marketplace transforming fans into owners with officially licensed digital cards featuring players from across all 30 MLB teams. Unlike other fantasy baseball platforms, So Rare managers truly own their fantasy experience, collecting, buying, selling, and competing with player cards against global opponents to win epic rewards. Win or lose, you still own your cards and there is no cost to play. Plus, the more you win, the more you advance, collecting increasingly powerful cards and accessing next level competitions and rewards. So we're recently partnered with MLB All-Stars Juan Soto and Julio Rodriguez to serve as brand ambassadors. Both are featured in Sober's current brand campaign and will engage in the Sober community throughout the season at MLB events. So head to Sober.com, that's spelled S-O-R-A-R-E dot com to draft your team of free player cards, set your lineup, and start competing today to win epic rewards. Again, that's so rare.com slash locked on to start playing today. Now, thank you all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. On Wednesdays, or on tomorrow's show, we'll talk about how Jacob deGrom and Nathan Eovaldi stack up against the other top twos in the American League. Rangers take on the Pirates this week. You can catch every pitch with the hometown broadcast on SiriusXM. Just download the SXM app and search Rangers. Now, Josh Young, it seems like he is on pace to break the Rangers rookie home run record, a record that was set just a few years ago by Adolis Garcia. And he has been absolutely crushing it as of late giving him that day off i think was a great move even though it was on his bobblehead night on texas tech night but in the last seven games he does have a six game hitting streak now he had a multi-hit game in this last one against the pirates including a two-run bomb that got the rangers kind of back into it in the ninth inning but over his last seven games he's got a pair of home runs four walks eight strikeouts hitting 308 on base of an even 400 and slugging 577 that is more like the josh young we know and love and we have seen for the entire year his rookie of the year campaign is is getting a little heated against masataka yoshida of the boston red sox again i am a little biased because i want josh young to win and so the rangers can get that draft pick um and i i don't think that guys who have been professionals for i don't know what a decade that it's i think that uh, Yoshida has been a professional. He is 29 years old. Granted, Josh Young is also a little on the older side, but he hasn't been a professional for 10 years like Yoshida yet. Um, but still, the Rookie of the Year campaign for Josh Young is going to be a lot based on counting stats, a lot based on home run totals. Y- Yoshida is a very, very good, um, very polished hitter. He's hitting at 308 with an on base of 381. Um, and his slugging percentage is just a little bit higher than Josh Young's, even though he has four fewer home runs. Young is not going to walk at the elite rate. He's probably not going to hit 300 this year, maybe eventually in his career. I, th- I could see him being a 300 hitter for a couple years, but for right now, that is not the guy that he is. But he's got 10 home runs, which is by far the most among rookies. Three ahead of Anthony Volpe, who is in second place. It is all about the hits counter. Um, he is second in hits, actually, to Masataka Yoshida. He is first in RBIs, so a lot of counting stats, a lot of, like, big round numbers. He's also first in runs with 31 runs scored among rookies. So the, if you're looking to make your case for Josh Young, uh, Rookie of the Year, that's a lot of what your case is going to be based off. Also, his defense at third base, which is not super beloved by um, by the advanced metrics of uh, outs above average at this point. It, he's in the 37th percentile there, 38th percentile of uh, arm strength, which... I think the arm strength is about right. The outs above average, I I don't necessarily agree with. I think he's been doing a much better job. And I think that it's kind of penalizing him a little bit for some scoops by Nathaniel Lowe. There were a couple of uh, great plays that he's made over the last few days that just haven't quite been made by Lowe. Tough scoops and not a whole lot of shade on Lowe. But I, I think that Josh Young's defense has at least been average, if not above average. I would most definitely lean towards average. He has been everything that I expected from him. The walk rate hasn't been quite what I expected. He's striking out a little bit more than I expected. I thought him, I thought of him as more of a polished hitter. He's, you know, hitting for a lot more power than I thought. The average exit velocity is in the top 16% of baseball. Same with his hard hit rate and his expected slugging is in the top 18% of baseball and he's barreling up pitches also in the top 21% of baseball. He's been very, very good at mashing the baseball and that 10th home run kind of shows you why he is second on this team in home runs which is not something that i thought i would say i did not think that he would be you know outpacing marcus simeon and nathaniel Lowe, and uh well he's not outpacing
outpacing Adoles Garcia. He is outpacing Corey Seager, but only because Seager has missed so much time. And Haim has really started to slow down. His OPS is all the way down to 820 now. And I'm starting to get a little concerned about Jonah Haim. In his last 15 games, at 61 at bats. He does not have a home run. He has just three walks, 13 strikeouts, hitting 279, but on base of 313 and slugging just 311. This is kind of what happened with him last year. And I was a little concerned now that they have been asking him to catch so often without Mitch Garver being there. By the way, Mitch Garver is starting his rehab assignment tonight. We'll see how long that lasts. It's expected to be a semi-lengthy rehab stint. I think it might be a week, maybe 10 days, because they want to make sure that he is fully, fully healthy when he comes back. And uh, I'm just a little concerned that Jonah Heim is, is just not using his legs to get into the power like he had in the early stages of this year. He might be pressing a little bit, I don't know what the deal is, but thankfully there's not a whole lot of pressure because, again, the rest of this lineup is so freaking good and so freaking consistent. But I'm just starting to get a little concerned about Jonah Heim not hitting a home run in 15 games is something that I'm keeping my eye on. And in his last seven, it's been it's been particularly rough. He's hitting just 148 with an on-base of 207 and does not have an extra base hit at all in his last seven games. So just something to keep an eye on. I'm not saying that, you know, the first month was a fluke or anything. I still think Jonah Heim is a first-rate top division catcher, but he is kind of falling back down to earth at a a little quicker pace than I was ready for. But another guy who I think I'm starting to get a little concerned about is Robbie Grossman in the month of May. It has been a rough stretch for him at 17 games. He's hitting 230 and on base of 253 and slugging just 351. He was not a guy who was going to hit for a whole bunch of power, but his on base being just 253 for a 17-game stretch is a little bit of a concern, especially since the defense is, is not that great in left field. I think it might be time for a little bit more of Josh Smith. I have liked what I've seen from Smith. He had a walk in today's game. He's been been stinging the baseball a lot harder. He's got an OPS of 761 on the season, and in his last seven games, he is hitting 300 with an on-base of 438 and slugging 615. That is significant for a guy who is not hitting for a lot of power, and he is not just getting the, like some lucky doubles or whatever. He is his home runs are are not cheapies. He is hitting them very very hard, and the on-base is always something that has been a plus for him. Sticking him out there in left field, I, I, I almost almost like his defense more than Robbie Grossman. I know that Grossman has like what 20 years experience or whatever in the outfield and Josh Smith just kind of switched to start playing the outfield last year, but I mean, I just like his bat better out there and getting him in the lineup as well as Ezekiel Duran. I think those two are your best bets for the seventh and eighth holes at this point. I think those guys provide you the most offense. I think they provide you the most competitive at bats and the best chance to win. This is the first off day for Ezekiel Duran and what feels like forever. And I will be happy to see him back in there in the lineup, hopefully again on Tuesday and not take him out for some time. Robbie Grossman was a guy who I thought was fine, a fine kind of placeholder in left field if you didn't have anybody that kind of blew you away, which was why I was kind of confused that they signed him because I thought, okay, Ezekiel Duran or Josh Smith, one of those guys is going to win the job outright. And they didn't do it out of camp, but the last couple of weeks, both of those guys have been really, really stepping up in big spots. I think that giving Josh Smith some more at-bats is a great idea. Maybe getting him to spell Corey Seager occasionally at shortstop and Ezekiel Duran in left field and Seager DH. He got some ways to be creative with the lineup, and uh, I think that both of those guys need to be in there a little bit more than Robbie Grossman. Grossman is fine. He is by no means better than Mitch Garver, and when, when Garver comes back, I expect to see Garver take a lot of the time at DH and maybe Ezekiel Duran and Josh Smith out there in left field. I don't know. It Having this many bats that are hot and are good is a good problem to have, and it kind of relegates Robbie Grossman to a lesser role as kind of a, I don't know, you'll stick him in there when you need him. And um, having Mitch Garver out there to spell Jonah High more often to kind of take this load off of him, give him just the occasion, more than the occasional day off, I think, to kind of lessen that load on his body. Not having to have his bat in there because the lineup is so deep, so you can put Ezekiel Duran hitting sixth or Josh Smith hitting six or Mitch Garver hitting six or whatever you're doing with the lineup. It gives you a lot more options and flexibility. Anyway, that was a long winded way of me saying, I, I like to see more Josh Smith and less Robbie Grossman at this point. I think Robbie Grossman is still a fine player. I don't think they go ahead and cut him, but 
with how Josh Smith is doing. He deserves more at-bats. I'm glad that we got to see him in this game. And I think that we'll be seeing him a little bit more often because the Rangers can always use a guy who can get on base at a high clip. And if he's starting to sting the ball, then then look out because that guy is possibly an everyday starter and, and might be a, a piece that the Rangers end up flipping for some bullpen help because they sure could use it. Coming up, we're going to talk about the bullpen, who's trustworthy, who's not, and why I'm just so absolutely sick of it and what the margins are for a good bullpen. But first, this episode is brought to you by Game Time. Last minute tickets is should be a an easy thing to do. And with the Game Time app, buying those is is really easy. There's a, your one stop shop. It is Game Time. You know, sometimes your favorite events, if you're wanting to buy things, you know, buy tickets like months and months in advance, it's all kinds of hassle and you got all kinds of fees and just difficult experience. Forget all the months of planning in advance get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football basketball baseball concerts comedy theater and more the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price if you find your tickets in the same section and row for less game time will credit you 110 percent difference so download the game time app create an account and use code locked on mlb for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account redeem code locked on mlb for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Now, this bullpen again is frustrating, but thank y'all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every day. On Thursday's show, we might just have a crossover with Ethan Smith of Locked On Pirates. The Rangers take on the Pirates the rest of this week. You can catch every pitch with the hometown broadcast. Just download Sirius XM, the SXM app, and search Rangers. Now, this bullpen, I, I'm just running out of words with my frustration with this bullpen it is a disaster it is a trash fire it is an absolute world ending catastrophe at this point the rangers are being chased very closely by the astros they've got jose altuve back and even with all the injuries and all the underperforming from the offense the astros are still one game back behind the rangers after this exceptional start i didn't pick the rangers to win the division even in my wildest dreams, I did not see a scenario where they do that. I mean, unless Jose Altuve goes down again. I mean, it just, there's just something about Jose Altuve. Whenever he's out, the Astros play terribly. And whenever he's back, like no matter what they're facing the last few years, it feels like he just kind of sparks them. But the Rangers have been good. They have stayed good. The starting pitching is great. The offense is great. And the bullpen is just needs to hang on more often. When your starter gets you five and two-thirds innings of one-run ball, even if you're facing a really good opposing starter who is just on their game like Luis Ortiz was last night, I mean, the Rangers' offense was clawed back enough in this one. I mean, four runs when your starter just gives up one is it should be enough to at least get you to extra innings. But again, the Rangers' extra innings is a, you know a kind of terrible word for these Rangers because that just means more innings pitched by this bullpen, which continues to be untrustworthy there's nobody in there that i trust at this point outside of will smith brock burke is kind of back on the up maybe you throw jonathan hernandez out there and hope that he keeps figuring out he had a nice outing in this one one inning without walking anybody in a pair of strikeouts did allow a couple of hits that were kind of weakly hit ground balls which again will happen when you're a sinker baller but still did get the two strikeouts but josh Bores and joe barlow who i was starting to trust a little bit more yeah that trust is absolutely gone the rangers give up five runs in the seventh inning all of them with two outs the the game completely changed on this this challenge the the challenge should be banned just for for this one game the challenge should absolutely be banned there was a play at the plate to get brian reynolds a, a ball that just barely squeaked by marcus simeon and a little bit more accurate of a throw by adolis garcia and i feel like he gets brian reynolds at the plate by a mile this was with two outs and it was what allowed the go-ahead run to score the rangers had tied it up in the sixth inning but in the bottom of the seventh they get that one run and then the doors just kind of just kind of fell off. Joe Barlow comes in and he walks a batter and then gives up an absolute tater of a grand slam. A what was a two to one game becomes a six to one game. Even though the Rangers claw out three runs combined in the eighth and ninth innings, it is just not enough against a couple of quality relievers that the Pittsburgh Pirates have. They don't have the strongest starting staff in their offense. Seems like it might might have been a little bit of a mirage 
not not everybody was going to be hitting with an 850 ish OPS. They do have some some really legitimate guys, including including Andrew McCutcheon, which I'm glad he's back. He got his 1500th hit with the Pirates in this one. A single. Brian Reynolds is very good and signed an extension. Swinsky seems like he's legitimately good, and uh, Connor Joe seems like he's also a legitimately pretty good player. But the Rangers should have been able to close this one out. They should have been able to get by, but. I mean, the, the margin for error is just so razor thin. We know Josh Boris has really good stuff, and the whole question with him is, you know, can that stuff actualize? Because when he misses, he misses middle-middle, and he does it fairly often. Same with that fastball that he threw to Carlos Santana that drove in that run on a play that was eventually overturned. Initially, it was called out. Dolce Garcia made a really great throw. Could have been a little bit more accurate, and Brian Reynolds just did not get the best jump because I, I thought that he probably should have scored fairly easily on that one. Adoles Garcia with a, a throw a little bit more up the line and, and less um, taking Jonah Heim away from home plate probably gets him. But that was where everything fell apart. And giving up five runs with two outs in an inning is just, it's just unacceptable. It's absolutely unacceptable, especially when you bring someone else in. And these guys just keep missing middle, middle. This is, they just keep missing their spots. They are not hitting with the command. They don't have the stuff to make up for it. Josh Spores almost has the stuff to make up for missing his spots if he's, you know, going, you know, low and high and away versus low and away even sometimes he's been beaten there but if you're missing middle middle it doesn't matter how good your stuff good your stuff is it is hard to get away with that i mean dane dunning actually even missed middle middle and somehow, somehow he got away with it more than josh spores did in this one but the fastball that ended up being thrown as the grand slam pitch it was a 2-2 count he left the fastball up and away it was supposed to, it looked like jonah heim was setting up down in so joe barlow really badly missed his spot on that one and it was a grand slam for um for marcano just not acceptable in that situation and a part of me wanted to just throw will smith out there in that situation part of me thought i, I don't know maybe throw jonathan hernandez out there but i mean his confidence is still shot and he only came in in that eighth inning with a game that was not close at that point it was a two to six game and he came in and it did throw a good inning of work and the only good thing about losing on the road is that this bullpen has to pitch one fewer <laughs> inning um, if they are if they haven't already given up the inning the lead by the ninth inning. But still, it's just it's so desperate in this situation. And when I talked earlier this week, I feel like I've talked about the bullpen every episode for the last like three weeks because it has been just such a huge problem. And the theme I keep coming to is that the Rangers really can't do much at this point. I mean, they have guys in there with major league stuff who have had success at the major league level. Like not all these guys are that, that bad. Like Brock Burke is not bad. John, Jonathan Hernandez is not a bad pitcher. Like Josh Bores might be a bad pitcher. Jose Leclerc has it in him to be a good reliever. And we've seen Joe Barlow do it at times, be a successful major leaguer. But, I mean, just one of these guys back there, just one of them needs to just like get really hot. Honestly, I feel like maybe moving on from Ian Kennedy was a little premature to bring up Josh Spores, but the Rangers really need to figure it out what Josh Spores is. And if, if he keeps missing middle, middle this consistently, I mean, it doesn't matter if he's got all the great stuff in the world. He just cannot be a high leverage reliever. He can't be below leverage. Reliever. He just, He's just a triple-A guy. That's just what he will be. If you miss your spots like that, that consistently, in those counts where he has leverage, he did that a couple a couple times against the Braves in that game that got away. He had an 0-2 count against different guys and just missed his spot badly. And when you've got two strikes against good major league hitters, or against any major league hitters, you have got to hit your spots. You cannot miss in the middle of the plate because these guys are just too good. I don't care if the Pirates are scuffling. I don't care if you're facing off against the A's or just the most hopeless offense in baseball. Like They are major leaguers, and they will take advantage of your misses in big ways. I I just don't know what to do about it. You can't make a trade at this point. Nobody's trading, and if you overpay for a bullpen arm then that uh, ends up failing, and then, that is, then you're in an even worse place place but the only good news even though there's a bunch of teams that are going to be trading for relievers this deadline because you know atlanta's pen is is not super great and they're going to be contenders Uh, i think houston could probably use a couple bullpen arms literally everybody even tampa bay 
could use a lot of bullpen arms, which is a very confusing thing to say for a team so good at developing pitching. But the Rangers aren't going to have to trade for a closer. I think you can just stick with Will Smith as your closer. Just get a couple of those mid-leverage to semi-high leverage guys and hope that one of LeClerc or Hernandez or Burke kind of works themselves out of this funk because this is not sustainable. The Rangers will will lose their division lead if they keep pitching like this, and they will lose a chance at the wild card. There are a lot of really good teams in the AL East, and I'm starting to look more at that chase than the division race because I think the Astros are probably going to end up passing the Rangers, maybe even by Memorial Day if this bullpen keeps this up. I mean, they can't score 10 runs and have fantastic starting pitching in every game, so eventually they're going to have to fix this bullpen. But for right now, you just kind of kind of sit there, cross your fingers, close your eyes, and um, hope for the best, which is not a sustainable strategy, but for right now, it's kind of all the Rangers can do. Thank you all so much for making Locked on Rangers your first listen every day. Like I said, we'll be back tomorrow, hopefully talking about a great Nathan Eovaldi game, a bounce-back game, and hopefully not just not a Rangers bullpen explosion. Please give me one day where I don't have to talk about that Rangers. That's going to do it for today's show. Until next time, don't forget to enjoy first place Texas Rangers baseball.